The short story and Women Must Weep, written by the Australian female writer Ethel Florence Robertson, née Richardson, was published under the name Henry Handel Richardson in 1931. There are a number of possible reasons why Richardson may have opted to adopt a male pen name. Not only did it give her a completely separate professional identity to that of her personal identity as the wife of the Scottish academic John George Robertson, but given her long-standing interest in the suffragette movement, which was a movement to fight for women's right to vote, her decision is likely also to have been influenced by a desire to avoid the gendered expectations and prejudices that female writers suffered in a male-dominated world. Taking place over the course of a single evening, And Women Must Weep tells the story of the young protagonist Dolly's experience of her first dance and how it turns out to be nothing like she expects it to be. Richardson utilises a third-person narrator with a limited omniscience to tell her story. In other words, the third-person narration is focused through the eyes of a single character, Dolly, so that we get access to only her thoughts and feelings, while we are left to infer those of the other characters from what they say and how they act. The story is structured in three parts. The dance itself takes up a large part of the middle and is bookended by its exciting build-up and crushing aftermath. In seeing everything from Dolly's perspective, we get a real sense of the evolution of her emotions from the very beginning, when she's brimming with naive excitement and misplaced self-confidence as she gets ready. Through the middle, when she's overcome by dejection, as she suffers rejection and humiliation at the hands of both the men and the women at the dance, to the end, when she experiences overwhelming anger, bitterness and disillusionment, as she realises that, for women in general and her in particular, life just isn't fair and there is nothing she can do about it. It's interesting to observe the way in which Richardson uses the description of the changing condition of Dolly's dress throughout the story as an outward reflection of her emotions. Richardson uses the story to explore how a patriarchal or male-dominated society oppresses women through their disempowerment and objectification as they are forced into prescribed roles. Note how even Dolly's name, short for Dorothy, is not picked randomly. Dolly is an extended form of doll, which in 17th century slang referred to a female pet or a favourite. By 1906, it had taken on its modern slang sense of an attractive young woman. Put all this together with the fact that a doll is also a pretty little toy that is dressed up and played with, and we begin to see how Richardson is communicating her feeling that society did not see much intrinsic worth in women beyond their looks and their usefulness as something to be picked up and discarded by men at will. Starting the evening with a confident sense of her own self-worth, a disillusioned Dolly comes to realise that her worth is something that is contingent upon male approval. The dance itself can be seen as a microcosm of contemporary society where there are strict rules on how the men and women are expected to behave. There is a prescribed number of dances which are set out on a programme that is handed out to the young unmarried women. They, accompanied by their older female chaperones, then sit passively looking pretty in rows of chairs beside the dance floor, hoping to attract a male. They are expected to wait here patiently until a man books a particular dance with them, which is then written on their dance card. They are, in turn, expected to gratefully accept any invitations that are offered. If a woman isn't booked, then she is destined to remain a wallflower. A woman is only permitted to take the initiative once, during the leap year dance, when she is able to ask a man instead. 
This dance reflects the wider societal convention that a woman could only propose to a man on February 29th. In other words, once every four years. What we can see from this is that women's freedoms were carefully controlled and sanctioned by men. What we also learn from Dolly's experience at the dance is that this world of male privilege extends so far as to forgive men for the mistakes they make, while women are punished for them. It would be simplistic, however, to characterise in black and white terms the men purely as oppressors and the women purely as victims. Richardson skillfully constructs a much more nuanced view whereby we see the men, who seem to have all the power, also having a particular role forced on them. Note that the strict etiquette of the time pressures the young man into dancing with Dolly even though he himself doesn't want to dance. Although do also note that he still has the freedom to complain about it, while Dolly does not. While the women have been conditioned to such an extent that they have become the instruments of their own oppression. Note how none of the other women characters is portrayed sympathetically. Although Auntie Char is benevolent on the surface, she pressures the young Dolly to conform in order to be appealing to the men, and there is little encouragement sympathy or comfort offered her when she is perceived to be a failure. There is little solidarity between the females. Note how Dolly doesn't interact with any of the other young women at the dance, as they are all fixated on attracting a man. And even though she tries to do everything right, Auntie Char and Miss Biddens communicate both verbally and non-verbally that that is still just not enough. A girl's first trip to a dance was seen as a rite of passage, a milestone in her life as it was a first step away from the world of children and into the world of adults. The story can therefore be described as a coming-of-age tale, exploring Dolly's loss of innocence and disillusionment, this rude awakening to the gender imbalances in society a first step on the path from childhood to adulthood. Rather than the evening of fun and dancing to which Dolly has been counting down the days, she discovers that it is, in fact, serious business. It is, effectively, a marriage mart, where it is the woman's role to attract an eligible bachelor in an environment where competition is fierce. Dolly's failure to take or to charm the men at the dance is a great source of disappointment for both Auntie Char and Miss Biddens, who seem to lay the blame firmly at her door for not appearing sufficiently agreeable. The title and women must weep is a quotation taken from a poem by the Victorian poet Charles Kingsley entitled Three Fishers. The full line which forms part of the poem's refrain reads but men must work and women must weep. It suggests not only that men and women have rigid and very separate roles in life prescribed by their gender, but also that women are expected to be weak, passive and helpless. It furthermore foreshadows the ending of the story as we leave Dolly alone in her room, crying bitterly over the judgment that she is a failure for not having attracted one single man. The story begins in medias res, as a girl, whom we later find out to be called Dolly, is in the finishing stages of putting on her dress. She was ready at last, the last bow tied, the last strengthening pin in place. The adverb, at last, evokes the impatience and the build-up of excitement she is feeling, although we don't know yet what for, while the repetition of the adjectival phrase, the last, and the fact that the two older women suggest she sit down and rest, or you'll be tired before the evening begins, evoke the almost ritualistic and time-consuming complexity of the process, the elaborate nature of her appearance, and the importance of the event to which they are going. She is in a state of nervous excitement, unable to bring herself to sit, for fear of crushing her dress, 
was so light, so airy. Note the repetition of the adverb so here and the italic font for emphasis, which communicate her wonderment as she marvels at the dress's beauty and delicacy. At this point in the story, she is still full of confidence, her mood as buoyant as her dress, and she is sure of herself, perhaps dangerously so, as she feels that she knows it all. How glad she felt now she had chosen muslin and not silk as Auntie Char had tried to persuade her. Muslin and silk are two different types of fabric. Muslin is made from cotton and has a matte or non-shiny finish, while silk is made from a fine and lustrous or shiny fibre produced from the cocoon of silkworms. It's interesting to observe not only that she has chosen the plainer, less luxurious of the two types of fabric, but also that there has been a disagreement with her aunt over what material to choose in the first place. The fact that she won suggests that she may be somewhat stubborn, naively unwilling to take the advice of someone with more experience. And the reader is left with a feeling that her choice may come back to haunt her later. At the moment, though, she is still in her little bubble and is enchanted with her own appearance. Never had she thought she was so pretty. Note how neither Auntie Char nor Miss Biddens, who is presumably the housekeeper, are quite so fulsome in their praise. For all they said was, well, Dolly, you'll do. And yes, I think she will be a credit to you. Nevertheless, she is overcome by a kind of gratitude for her pinky white skin, her big blue eyes and fair curly hair and pity for those girls who hadn't got them. Her attitude could be described as verging on hubristic here, which is when someone is arrogant and dangerously overconfident. Hubris is usually followed by nemesis, or the punishment that puts the person in their place. For Dolly, it will be the sharp reminder that her attractiveness is judged by others, not by herself and that her debut at the ball will be classified as a failure. She is so excited that she is unable to sit down, standing very stiff and straight at the window, pretending to watch for the cab, although her heart was beating pitter-pat. And we finally find out what the momentous occasion is that has caused all of the excitement and elaborate preparations. For this was her first real grown-up ball. This, of course, was much more of a milestone in a young woman's life in the early 20th century than it would be considered now, for a number of reasons. Before the invention of the concept of the teenager in 1945, with its distinct culture, the line separating children from adults was much more pronounced, and a girl's coming out in society, like a butterfly emerging from a cocoon, was an indication that she was now a grown-up and therefore of marriageable age. The fairy tale perfection of the evening is jeopardised, however, even before she leaves the house. The words of advice given by Miss Biddens about the importance of remembering her dance steps somewhat spoilt things, and those given by Auntie Char. Now, Dolly, remember not to look too serious. We will frighten the gentleman off only make her feel more pressured and nervous as she will find out that all of the responsibility for attracting a man is placed squarely upon her shoulders. Note how the cramped cab with its narrow seats perhaps symbolises this pressure on her to conform. Not only have Miss Biddens's and Auntie Char's words taken a bit of a shine off the evening already, but things then go from bad to worse as stepping out of the cab she caught the bottom of one of her flounces, the skirt was made of nothing else, on the iron step and ripped off the salvage, which was a narrow border, often of different or heavier threads than the fabric, that stopped it from unravelling. Auntie Char blames her for this, chiding her, My dear, how clumsy! And she's left on the verge of tears. All of a sudden, it seems as though she is being judged against a harsh set of adult standards and is found to be wanting. The 
cloakroom attendant looks in vain for suitable cotton to mend the dress, and so the torn salvage, there was nearly half a yard of it, had just to be cut off, leaving a raw edge. Note how the damage to her dress can be interpreted as an outward sign of the damage that her self-esteem is beginning to suffer, with her evening threatening to unravel, just like the bottom of her dress. The disappointments now come thick and fast, as her naive bubble is burst by the reactions of those around her. In the cloakroom, she had expected the woman to exclaim, What a sweet, pretty frock, when she handled it. When all she did say was, This sort of stuff's bound to fray. Already self-conscious, believing that everyone had their eyes fixed on her torn dress, Dolly gets a massive reality check as she enters the hall, realising with dismay that it was full of lovely dresses, some much, much prettier than hers, which suddenly began to seem rather too plain, even a little dowdy or old-fashioned. Consumed by doubt, she reflects that perhaps after all it would have been better to have taken her aunt's advice and chosen silk. She now appears to be able to do nothing right. Sitting in the second row just irritates her aunt, who said snappily, Come, come, child, you mustn't tuck yourself away like that, or the gentleman will think you don't want to dance. Note the pressure placed on Dolly to display herself and to make herself passively appealing to the men by showing that she had a programme, by holding it open on her lap. This does not have the desired effect, however, and Dolly remains left out even while other ladies were being requested for the third time. It gets to the point where Auntie Char, in desperation, has a private word with the Master of Ceremonies, who goes off on an embarrassing quest to find her a partner. Note how Dolly is objectified here, her agency completely removed as she is offered up to several gentlemen who one by one reject her. The way the Master of Ceremonies thinks he is doing Dolly a favour by asking her to dance, an offer which etiquette demands, she is not only unable to refuse, but which also pressures her to look glad about, even though she must be dying inside, and humiliates her by drawing attention to them, by putting one hand on his hip and the other over his head, as if he were dancing the hornpipe to make the rest of the set laugh suggests that Richardson saw this oppression as subtle and insidious, because while the master's actions are superficially benevolent, they are actually severely undermining. This is just the first in a series of humiliations for Dolly, as she is passed around under Auntie Char's direction, between her friend's son, who already has a fiancé and so is therefore not remotely interested in dancing with her, and another young man who hadn't danced at all yet, but just stood looking on. And this one needed a lot of persuasion. He was ugly, lanky, and as soon as they stood up, said quite rudely, I'm no earthly good at this kind of thing, you know. And he wasn't. It's interesting to note that while he is able to make his displeasure clear and to make mistakes by treading on her foot and putting her out of step without feeling the need to apologise, when she went wrong herself, she feels obliged to say, I beg your pardon, which he then has the audacity to accept, as though she is the only one at fault. Auntie Char becomes increasingly hostile towards Dolly, interpreting her sense of awkwardness and humiliation as mere truculence. Now Auntie sort of went for her. It's no use, Dolly, if you don't do your share. For goodness sake, try and look more agreeable. Dolly tries to do her best, even though she is thoroughly miserable, as she sits with a stiff little smile gummed to her lips. And, did any likely-looking partner approach the corner where they were, this widened till she felt what it was really saying was, Here I am! Oh, please take me! The irony, of course, is that the more Dolly forces herself, the more unnatural and desperate she becomes, and therefore the more unappealing to any prospective dance partner. Richardson skillfully uses ellipsis to evoke Dolly's anticipation, followed by disappointment as she watches the men come and go. 
she had several false hopes. Men looking so splendid in their white shirt fronts would walk across the floor and seem to be coming, and then it was always not her. Once more, her description of Dolly's dress seems to reflect her emotional state. But her own dress was beginning to get quite tashy from the way she squeezed her hot hands down in her lap. We can only infer what Richardson meant with the adjective tashy, as a definition for it has proved impossible to find, but from the context it would seem to convey that her dress has perhaps become somewhat wrinkled, damp and sorry looking from having her hot or perspiring hands pushed into it. Dolly's shame at her dance card's emptiness finally gets too much for her, and seizing a moment when people were dancing, she slipped it down the front of her dress. The shame, however, soon turns to anger and bitterness as she realises the way she is trapped by her gender into powerlessness. Oh, these men who walked round and chose just who they fancied and left who they didn't. How she hated them. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. Note how the repetition of it wasn't fair underlines her sense of frustration. When Dolly is given the chance to ask a dance partner for herself in the leap year dance, she tries to hold on to at least a shred of her dignity. She wasn't going to ask them when they never asked her. She's inwardly defiant, refusing as she pretends to have a headache. Note how Dolly is now even jealous of Auntie Char, who is exempt due to her age from the rules which confine her niece. Nobody expected Auntie Char to dance or thought it shameful if she didn't. She could do and be just as she liked. Yes, tonight she wished she was old, an old, old woman, or that she was safe at home in bed. This dreadful evening to which she had once counted the days behind her. Even as the night wore on, that she was dead. Dolly's humiliation continues after supper. She endures another pity dance with the son of Auntie Char's friend, but her state of misery is such that she can't move properly. Her legs seem to have forgotten how to jump, heavy as lead they were, as heavy as she felt inside, and she couldn't think of a thing to say. Note the double use of ellipsis here and the repetition of heavy as, which slow the pace of the line and seem to reflect the emotional weight that she is feeling on her young shoulders. She is also obliged to dance with a boy much younger than she was, almost a schoolboy, who she heard them say was making a positive nuisance of himself. Once more, we see how the behaviour of males and females are held to different standards. Even though the young boy's conduct is not condoned, nobody seems to actually do anything to stop him. They leave the ball early as there was nothing to stay for. Note how even though Auntie Char says nothing, her disapproval of Dolly's performance is evident in her body language. Auntie Char just sat and pressed her lips and didn't say a word. When they arrived back at the house, Dolly fled to her own little room and turned the key in the lock. Note the way she violently discards the dress, now as crushed as she is, which so enchanted her at the beginning of the evening. She tore off the wreath and ripped open her dress, now crushed to nothing from so much sitting, and threw them from her anywhere, anyhow. Her room, however, doesn't provide her with any kind of sanctuary, as the walls were thin, and she could hear the two voices going on, Auntie Charles telling and telling and winding up at last quite out loud with, well, I don't know what it was, but the plain truth is, she didn't take. Note how Auntie Charles doesn't seem to empathise at all with Dolly's plight. Not only does she make no effort to lower her voice in order to spare Dolly's feelings, but she also makes it very clear that she perceives the failure to be Dolly's and Dolly's alone. Dolly feels suitably humiliated. Oh, the shame of it! The sting and the shame! Her first ball and not to have taken, to have failed to attract the gentleman. This was a slur that would rest on her all her life. 
There is, however, another part of her which acknowledges the injustice of this, and she becomes defiant. And yet, and yet, in spite of everything, a small voice that wouldn't be silenced kept on saying, It wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. It's interesting to observe that she is aware that she's become objectified. No better than an item in a shop that no one thinks is a bargain. And almost more than anything, she thought she hated the memory of that smile. It was like trying to make people buy something they didn't think worthwhile. The story's ending is a million miles away from its beginning. Dolly's naive excitement has been replaced by disillusionment and despair, as alone in her room, and with the blanket pulled up over her head, her face driven deep into the pillow, she cried till she could cry no more. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.